on the eve of their summit here in Doha, divided Arab leaders face countless challenges. With the winds of global recession blowing their way and the tide of foreign intervention reaching new heights, they've been caught off guard and are feeling the heat. Where is the great Arab world? Shame on them. So what does the future hold for Arabs in the shadow of foreign powers? Their aim always to divide the Arab world. This is Empire. Welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. As strategic and economic upheavals rock the entire world, leaders in the Arab world seem to be ever more consumed by petty domestic and bilateral bickering and are missing the bigger picture. America's failure to transform the greater Middle East through force, followed by a dramatic global recession, have opened the way for a shift in the distribution of world power with serious consequences for this energy-rich, conflict-ridden region. But Arab leaders seem oblivious to the challenges and, dare I say, opportunities arising from the rubble of war and the ruins of collapsed financial markets. Before we discuss how the Arab world is affected or could affect the agendas of competing global and indeed regional powers, Tim Tate recalls a century of colonial and imperial intervention in the Arab world. The Arab world is one of the most divided regions in the world. That region was under complete, almost complete control of Western powers. The borders that separate Arab states are artificial creations imposed upon them by Western imperialism. The Arab world has for centuries been overrun by colonial powers. The British, the French, even the Italians have all occupied these lands. But the Ottoman Turks created the first Islamic empire. It was certainly a unified empire. Um, it brought together a large part of the Middle East in one economic unit, one unit with unified governance. But by the outbreak of the First World War, Turkey was the sick man of Europe. At the end of the war, Britain reneged on a promise to create a pan-Arab state. Instead, it and France carved up the Ottoman Empire between them. It was absolutely one of the most uh, uh, naked instances of an uh, imperialist uh, uh, land grab or, uh, 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 and also a violation of the, peace, of the wishes of the people concerned. Independence would come, but with a heavy price. In Algeria, nationalists fought the French army for eight years. One million Algerians died in the struggle for freedom from colonial rule. While in the dying days of its empire, Britain fought bitter rearguard actions to stifle nationalism in Egypt and Aden. But each battle for liberation put another nail in the coffin of Arab unity. They viewed independence as being almost sacred because they had struggled so long to obtain it, they didn't want to let it go. That in itself was like placing a veto on, on movement towards uh, closer integration. By the time the old colonial powers were kicked out, new empires were buying friends and influence across the Middle East. There clearly was Cold War competition with both the United States and the Soviet Union trying to beef up uh, their client states. In the case of the Soviet Union, this was Egypt and Syria. In the case of the United States, it was the Gulf states and Israel. And it wasn't just an ideological proxy war. The whole issue of oil um, clearly has dominated particularly American foreign policy uh, towards the Middle East. The US State Department identified the Middle East as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. This was always the great uh, concern of Western military planners that in a crisis the Soviet Union would try to make a grab for the oil resources of Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and the other Gulf states. Throughout the Cold War, America and the Soviet Union set the region's nations at each other's throats. In the bloody Iran-Iraq war, 
both superpowers poured arms and support into the conflict. Two million Iranians and more than half a million Iraqis died in the eight-year conflict. By the 1980s, America had swapped the subtlety of war by proxy for more overt intervention, trying but failing to assassinate Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. This mad dog of the Middle East has a, a goal of a Muslim fundamentalist revolution. It unified Arab opinion at an emotive level, but equally one should not forget that Gaddafi himself was deeply unpopular with many of the other Arab regimes. I think that exemplifies this tension and this split within the Arab world. Decades after the Middle East threw off its colonial yoke, not even Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza has welded its nations into a coherent Arab resistance. Where is the great Arab world that they taught us about in school? They have abandoned us. Shame on them. The Arab experience uh, of trying to promote unity has not been a success at all. The imperial powers built instability into the very DNA of the entire region. Today, it runs too deeply to allow any lasting unity. With me to discuss the challenges uh, facing the Arab world is uh, Robert Fisk of The Independent and Michael Hudson of Georgetown University, as well as uh, Alain Gresh of Le Monde Diplomatique and uh, Munir Shafiq of the uh, Islamic uh, National Conference. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, Robert, let me start with you. There's a change in Washington, change of administrations. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen in the report, there has been seismic changes over the last century as one uh, world power moves and other world powers comes in in the Arab world. Are we seeing such seismic change today in the Arab world? In the Arab world, I don't see it. I mean, the only seismic change that I've witnessed in the 33 years that I've lived out here has been that when I arrived in 1976, all the West's enemies, and here I'm making Israel an honorary member of the West, whether it deserves to or not is a different question, mm -hmm. were nationalist, socialist, pro-Soviet. Now all the West's enemies, whether you believe it or not, are all Islamist. The Hamas or Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda in Iraq or Al-Qaeda in Algeria. Um, and that has been the big change. I still think that we Westerners don't realize this. We still think it's the same old story uh, where we can get someone like Arafat, who we call a super terrorist, and we turn him into a super statesman, right. and in the end we turn him back into a super terrorist again. We don't have the same control that we had over events, but Obama is not going to make any difference. But has, uh, Michael, the American military project failed in the Middle East or in the Arab world? to transform the region through force? Well, first of all, I don't know whether I agree with Robert uh, on, on the state of affairs generally. It seems to me there's one constant, and that is certainly, I think, in Washington's perspective, whatever administration you're talking about, really since World War II, uh, there's been, a, I think, a, an understanding or a, a desire that that Arab world is ours. <clears throat> it's part of, it's our sphere of influence. We have to to contain the Soviets from coming in. We have to contain other bad guys. And whether or not we're actually doing it, that's another question. But I think the, uh, the presumption is that the United States will use, and of course is using, a, a very substantial military machine uh, and has implanted it really around the region to such an extent that even though we're not an empire in name, uh, the domination that the United States at least formally exerts is, I think, as substantial as, as whatever the but British did. But it is did. withdrawing, for example, from Iraq by 2011. Well, I think we should wait and see. Yeah. It's Obama, committed to withdraw. Well, <laughs> I think we should wait and see. It seems to me that Obama has already backtracked significantly from his campaign promises. And, of course, one of the reasons he was elected is, you know, we're going to get out of Iraq. But he's under very strong pressure from uh, the U.S. military, from General Petraeus and others, uh, now that they think that they have stabilized the situation, not to spoil it. And that's why the uh, commitment to leave, oh, a few troops to guard the embassy, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. turns out we're talking 35 to 50,000 troops. Maybe they will be out by 2011. But there are plenty of military thinkers in Washington who say we're going to be there for a long time. 
Alain, uh, in Europe, they don't see it this way. I, I guess they are a bit more optimistic about America changing course in the Middle yeah, East. Yeah, there is a, a completely Obama, Obama uh, in the public opinion. Uh, there was polls in France. If there was election in France, he would get 80 percent of the votes. And of course, for many reasons, but most of the reasons are not linked with uh, uh, Middle East. But they are linked in part with the rejection of uh, Bush policy. And uh, in, in the region, and the military, uh, the militarization of this policy. But if you look at the region, um, I don't see any other period in which there were so many foreign and Western troops in this region, except perhaps Second World War. I mean, we have troops in Afghanistan and Western. We have troops in Iraq. We have troops in Lebanon. We have the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict with involvement. We have Darfur. We have Somalia. I mean, and we have the Navy, the U.S. Navy. I think the militarization of the Western policy is a real problem, and, and I think it is a failure. Alan, I calculated for our Sunday magazine in London some months ago that we now have, we the West, mm. now have 22 times as many military personnel in the Muslim world than the Crusaders had in the 12th century. Mm. And that's the answer to your question. Mm. Uh, and we're always arriving here with our guns and our horses and our swords and our Apache helicopters, promising freedoms, democracy. Mm. Napoleon did it, General Moore did it in 1917 in Baghdad, and still we do it. Mm. And there are no democracies. But Munir, it, it has failed in Iraq, hasn't it? And it seems to be failing in Afghanistan. So has it reached a moment of saturation no, today? No, never, because I think, uh, first of all, you can't imagine the West without militarizing the world situation and launching wars. So this is the history, and perhaps there are many failures also in their history, but they come back again. You see, it's not a matter of only victory. It's uh, the nature of dominating the world, of having that super superiority uh, on the world. It's a must to have the military and use force. But don't you get the sense that that particularly over the last eight years had been voted out of the, of the, of the White House? That's why we have a new Obama administration? No, no, no. I, I think we, we have a new Obama administration because uh, President Bush totally screwed up our domestic affairs, economic, moral, legal, and so forth. And the war in Iraq? The war in Iraq, of course, is a, is a big problem. But I'd like to come back. I don't think that the Western presence is essentially strictly military. I think it's much, much more political. Uh, unfortunately, from an American point of view, the United States has lost the kind of uh, credibility and respect that I think it actually did have some decades ago. Uh, and when we, uh, when we use the military unwisely, as we certainly have done in Iraq, then of course it looks like a failure. But all hegemons have their failures. Empires have problems. The question is, uh, are our problems getting so big that are we are gradually in retreat? But that Michael, I don't understand the narrative. First of all, we went to Afghanistan and won the war. Then we left Afghanistan, rushed off to Iraq, and won that no, war. No, then we lost that, it. Before that, excuse me, yeah. they, they went to Palestine. Of course, yes. Because yes. Sharon's war yeah. in uh, the spring of 2002, yeah. it's an American war but against the Palestinians. By proxy. American of course, war by yes, proxy. yes. But what I'm saying is, then the Iraq when, when we're going to back Iraq, to Afghanistan to win all over again, I thought we won that. No, no, we lost it, so we're going back to win. Now we're losing it again, probably. Unfortunately, I mean, what on yes. earth are you doing, you people? Well, the problem is you can only fight so many wars at a time. <laughs> and, you know, we, we are fighting, yeah. you know, we have Af Iraq, we have Afghanistan, we have the war on terror, we have, at least by proxy, the war in Palestine. Uh, it's, it's a sign, I think, of imperial decline but when you, know, you actually have to use your military. But you know, and we are using ours too much. But it seems to me if, if wars don't establish peace and make business, then they have failed as wars because there is a reason for I war. I don't think there is only one uh, American policy possible. I mean, Clinton was a kind of hegemony policy in the Middle East, but using other means. Military is a part of the American strategy, but it's not all military. Bush was more or less all military, and it is a failure. Uh, what Obama will do is another question. Is it, let's, let's talk about it for yeah. a second, because now they're talking in America about the change from hard power to soft power, mm. meaning a bit more diplomacy, a bit presumably more mm. de development. Do you, do you take that on board? No, because uh, if they want to make soft diplomacy in Middle East, they must solve the Palestinian question.
And I don't think on this question, in any case, there will be a fundamental change in the American policy. But before we go to the Palestinian question, I need, I need to pick your brain on that one particular point, again, going back to Europe. Don't you get the sense that now Europe is feeling some sort of a failure on the part of America, mm. and hence stepping in? Mm. And for that occasion, let's talk French. Mm. Sarkozy mm. of France. He's mm. moving everywhere from Algeria to the United Arab Emirates, creating new Mediterranean projects, interfering mm. in Gaza, mm. in Palestine, mm. in Syria. There is a new French policy that is surging once again. Isn't that because of an American void? In F the First, I don't think there is a... I mean, if there is a new French policy, and I think there is a new policy, it is a, a policy of alliance with the United States and the return in the NATO. NATO. Of course, France has its own interest and its own policy, but strategically, I think, and we have seen it in the Gaza war, we are on the same position than the American. And we decided to send a, a ship to to check that no arm uh, arrived to Gaza. I mean, really, this is a, a, a big change, and but, but I, unfortunately... No, no. With, with, all, with all due respect, I don't think that the alarm bells are ringing in Washington because France has established a military base in Abu Dhabi. No, I, I agree. No, no, but it's not an alarm bell. It's a part of the American strategy. But it is I'm opening dialogue with Syria. Yeah. It, is, uh, it has opened channels to Hezbollah, and it seems to Hamas next. It is creating a new Mediterranean region. And from, and, uh, from and America, American point America of view, this is, a, this is not a bad idea. But America wasn't even invited. Well, do you think Washington is to totally unhappy to have the French doing this and the Brits doing that? So Washington you think that's what it is, just another way, force? I believe you are. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Great Manier, you want to say something? Thing. Thing. Yes, I, I think that you can't exactly consider that the French is just the same path of the Americans. I think there is a little bit a margin or difference. Of course, of course. One should uh, notice that because all politics uh, works in the margin, not on the, ba uh, the uh, I mean the general trend. You have to see the nuance, what you can call Well, the it French right. were kind enough to give us Syria and Lebanon, weren't they? Uh, yeah. And the Brits were kind enough to give us Palestine and Jordan. I mean, even with in the, the war with the Gaullist, and Iraq. Gaullist policy in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a real French independent policy. I'm not saying that today the French policy is American policy. It's not true. But it's just it's, hyper? It is. It's just hyper? No, it's not just hyper, but it has changed. I mean, in the vision of the United States, our relation with the United States, there is a fundamental change, at least for Sarkozy. That doesn't mean that you are going to do the same thing that the Americans are doing. But, uh, but Robert, do you think, if the French are not that nuanced with the Americans, are at least the Russians now being a bit nuanced, at least in their relationship with Syria, Iran, they here very, we have another naval base? They weren't very base. nuanced in Chechnya, were they, if we're talking about the Muslim world? Um, Look, I, I, I miss the days of the Soviet Union because I miss the days when there was a balance. It may have been a balance of terror, nuclear balance, but at least, and I mean, I, I was in the Middle East for part of this period, you felt that the Americans had limits. They would not go into Iraq. They wouldn't have dared to touch Iraq if the Soviet Union still existed. Why, 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 why? Because I think... T take the example of Hanoi, for instance. Hanoi was an alliance with the Soviet Union, and they bombed Hanoi for so many years, and they crushed it, even. But that was in a different part of the world. There was no value to Vietnam, was there, apart from the spread and they of communism? And entered to Lebanon. You quote remember, unquote. in 1958, yes, they entered course. Lebanon, and uh, they made a lot of... Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Well, they, they didn't end up fighting in Lebanon. But they certainly were more restrained than they, they were, were more if they are unilateral power. Far away countries like no, Vietnam no, 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 were not no, no, included no, no, in this, sure. but the Middle East was not, they were much more careful. It, it was only when the Soviets would step in and warn the American presidency of what would happen if the war continued between Egypt and Israel, for example, that the Americans came in to stop it. See, and when you become a hegemon, you begin to make mistakes, and that's why Washington and under Obama, I think they are sophisticated enough to realize that we need to move in a more multilateral direction. We need the French help, we need the British help, we need to avoid uh, stupid uses of military force. That's what, that's what we but need. But they're going to uh, Afghanistan in, in to win the war there, yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah. no? We can't one. do it with military uh, force. In, in accordance to the Russians, I think they came back as a big power now, a military mm. big yeah. power. And the same in the, on the same standard of the Soviet Union, mm. from the military point yeah. of view. Secondly, and uh, I was expecting... But you know, they have 10% of the American doesn't military matter. budget. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because when you talk about the nuclear war and uh, you talk about the rockets, 
I think they are perhaps in some uh, cases they are more developed. You're not suggesting Amri. anyone is going to be using any nuclear war anytime soon, are you? No, well, but, they, but you know, they have, have, uh, we're worried about one country in the region, no, aren't we? No, and uh, two possibly, if you include. But well, uh, speaking of that, if I, yes, go ahead. Uh, but it is on the table. I mean, uh, why they are uh, developing now the atomic bombs? They are de developing the rockets. Uh, no, 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 there is a race now. The war race. What the Russians have is geography. Mm. They're between us and Afghanistan, Pakistan. They can yeah. use uh, influence that way. I was expecting, as a matter of fact, that the American strategy should put or will put the priority, the first priority, to face the developing of the military side of, in the Russia with the Russians. But I think now Obama had made Iran his first priority in the strategy. Well, and it is the same path of Bush. Let's talk and about that. He for started a to compromise with the Russians and to compromise with the Chinese because he is going to concentrate against uh, Iran in the coming two years. Look, uh, I'm a critic of American policy, always have been. But I think that uh, realistically, you have to say that there's not really all that much chaos in this region. Yeah, there's a war on in Iraq, there's a, there's a war there. But basically, the American hegemony still is very much in place. But there's look at, chaos. Look at the, look at the, look at the, what do you mean? Right from, from, from the borders of the old British Empire to the Mediterranean, Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Iraq, yeah. I mean, Sudan, Pakistan, yeah. Sudan, I mean, for God's sake. In, sakes, in, Wash it's in Washington, chaos. if you look at the map and you count oh. who your friends are, mm. most of them are our friends. Oh, just one last point on, uh, just uh, to pick up on, to finish with the question <clears> of Iran. Now the Arabs are being asked to be uh, to choose between Iran and Israel, between be, being radicals or moderates. What do, what do you well, think that is it's going? It's a catastrophe, just to, to think of it. Israel is an enemy, as a matter of fact. Iran is a friend and, we, and uh, is a neighbor and is a Muslim country. And we have to think of how to deal with Turkey and Iran on a, a friendly and cooperative basis, not as enemies. And but not that's not where it's heading, is it? No. No, but it, it's the same. Uh, I mean, it's Reagan policy saying to the Arab, please come with us fighting the Soviet Union mm -hmm. with Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's, it will fail. I, I don't think it's a, it has any chance to succeed this kind of policies. Munir, you did have a very good relationship with Turkey because you had the Ottoman Empire, which was the last time there was any Arab unity, wasn't it? <laughs> you, know, you know, by the way, by the way, our people, the masses, they never considered the Turks as occupiers or imperialists. Only in a certain stage when the Turkish you know, nationalists mm -hmm. took place and they tried to, Turk, uh, to, to go, go against the Arabs and so on. But, but Turkey now uh, has its own agenda and it wants to get involved but in Turkey the Arab world. But Turkey is a friendly country. It's not our enemy. Well, it Turkey has like a lovely that. military relationship with Israel. It I, certainly I does. Know that. I, I know that. I'm, I, I That's am okay. also opposing this if you want. I am not yeah. agreeing with but that. But it also has excellent relationship with Syria and I think Syria is becoming a new player, and we're going to probably be talking a bit about that later. But before we go to a break, I'll leave you with a short report on how a soap opera inspired by early 20th century Syrian resistance to French colonialism had millions of Arabs glued to their TV sets. For the past three years, people across the Middle East have rushed from prayer back home or to coffee houses to catch the latest installment of Bab al Hara, the neighborhood gate. It's one of a new wave of costume dramas depicting plucky nationalists fighting against the evils of colonial oppression. <laughs> The original story was about the female lead getting divorced. But I also wanted to focus on the national movement in Palestine and the resistance during that period, mainly Syrian resistance to French occupation. But what makes period soap operas like Bab al Hara so popular? Are they accurate portrayals of history, escapist fantasy? or wish fulfillment for a time when enemies were much easier to identify. I believe the work had encouraged the Arab viewer to search for bygone days that people feel no longer exist. I believe the work has awakened nationalist and patriotic feelings amongst the Arab viewers. The introduction of satellite television in the 1990s had a profound influence on the concept of pan-Arabism. 
Unconstrained by national borders, their programs reach into both modern secular states and more traditional conservative societies. <laughs> but can soap operas do what a hundred years of political writing and action failed to do? Bring the Arab world together? Our experience in Bab al-Hara has shown that you can use art to instigate change in society. Drama can be used as a weapon to get the message across. Whatever the future for Arab unity, soap operas romanticizing its struggles in the colonial past are capturing the hearts and minds of present-day viewers.